Obviously, I would like to thank organizers for the invitation, for putting this workshop together and for the invitation. Uh, so I now I'm visiting uh, Dresden, but I basically spend most of my time in Kent State University. This is the place, largest public school in Ohio, uh, just 30 minutes drive from a uh, wonderful city of Cleveland, the home of world-known Cleveland Orchestra and Cleveland Clinic. So if you have, uh, if you're just passing by, uh, it's worth visiting. Wonderful city. So uh, my talk today, the first part of the talk, I will, gonna, I'm going to describe the model for a topological insulator and sort of the, the key features of this model um, uh, that it's basically simple, it's in 3D, it's a cubic lattice, there is no obvious uh, spin orbit coupling in the model and most importantly that there are strong uh, Hubbard interactions between the, uh, between the fermions. Um, so I will go into details so of the first part will be mostly discussion of, of this model and its properties and the second part of my talk will be uh, will discuss the experimental relevance of, of, of what I've, I, I will told you I will tell you in the first part so before I proceed let me acknowledge uh, the uh, uh, some uh, financial support from the Army Research Office and partial financial support from the MPI PKS all right, so I'm going to motivate this, um, uh, this work and basically search for the models by, um, by basically quoting the, uh, referring to the Volovic's work, most recent one from 2010, his preprint, he, he actually put up the simple uh, 3D Hamiltonian and the claims that, that uh, upon changing some of the parameters of this Hamiltonian, and principally in 3D you can generate, if you attach the boundary to your sample, uh, then you can generate the in-gap states, and this in-gap states will be non-trivial, will have a direct spectrum, etc. And so very naive thinking, my part is that, like, can we actually generalize, can we actually take this literally, this Hamiltonian, let's forget this relevant for helium 3b, for example. So just take it literally as just some letters here, delta and xi, whatever that can be. And can we actually come up with the model which ultimately in some mean field, some controlled mean field, will have uh, the model will have exactly the same Hamiltonian and hence will have the same properties in helium 3b, right? So of course the caveat here is that as we know in nature it's extremely hard to realize this type of phases so still we hope that maybe we'll, we'll get uh, lucky. So in that regard I would like of course to mention the work by Bernie Vies, Hughes and Jean who basically uh, who work with the two, co uh, well, there are two time reversal copies of the 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, which ultimately is very, uh, very similar to the, uh, to the helium 3B Hamiltonian in the mean field. They have a spin orbit coupling, and there are two bands, whole and electron band, if you like. And indeed, if you can, you can just put it on the system uh, on the stripe, say, and analyze uh, eigenvalues, you will see that indeed, in, under some certain choice of the parameter of this m and lambda, principally can generate the in gap states. So that's good, and as Marcus nicely described yesterday, that indeed uh, you can actually implement this thing in the, into he, uh, Mercury uh, Telluride structures and basically observe this uh, effect. So I'm back to, uh, to the model, and um, actually I, this is the most general version of it. I'm going to talk about sort of specific limit for this model. So we have two bands of fermions. They're labeled by momentum k, these thermionic states are labeled by momentum k, a spin sigma, and the flavor a. And I'm going to consider the following case. So I will say that the interaction between the fermions of flavor 1 are much larger than the interaction between the Hubbard interaction between the fermions of flavor 2. Uh, and at the same time, I will sort of naturally say that, you know, the bandwidth for one is much less than bandwidth for two. So, in the sort of in this language, it means that we're basically considering quasi homopoly if you, if you like, not localized fermions of uh, type one, and basically metallic fermions non-interacting uh, type two. And they are actually connected through this hybridization element, <coughs> which um, matrix element here, an important property of this element is that actually it's odd under uh, reversal operation. Uh, why is this and, uh, and why it has to be so all motivated in what follows? Uh, but um, as, you, as you look at this, again, if you just process through, you will see that in this limit, this model looks very similar to the 
uh, to the model of uh, Phil Anderson. I mean, naturally, I mean, all the, all the great discoveries in condensed matter physics somehow relate to, to the work of Philip Anderson. So this is another example of it. So I'm now going to ignore completely why, uh, just again, as a motivation, part of the motivation is just, let's just forget about Hubbard U completely. And then we're at the mean field level, right? We're at the Gaussian level, we have only uh, uh, the one particle problem essentially, and here we will have uh, my type 1 is there, I denote them F now, from now on, and type 2 fermions I will denote them in sub C, conductions and Fs, and then there is this, um, there is this hybridization element, as we agree, it's odd in momentum, and I'll just take it sine kx, sine ky, and so this is already, this is very close to helium 3p Hamiltonian in the mean field, right? The only thing that we have to make sure, I mean, we just choose them to be holes and this one electrons and we're basically in business, right? The only thing that, of course, I mean, this is most likely is completely irrelevant for the, uh, for the real materials because we know there are interactions, right? So somehow we have to come up with a scheme which ultimately will lead us to the same Hamiltonian, but it must be controlled. So we have to somehow take uh, care of the interactions in the controlled way. And then, uh, and then this model will give us the, the states we want. So, okay, interactions. Uh, this is very highly non-intuitive thing because even in the Anderson model, as you know, if I just take one F level, we don't have many, just one F. So there he showed in 1961 that you can actually form the magnetic moment. Again, you're forming the moment, it's not a long range state, not at all. You just show that if you, you, you when you hybridize that F state with a conduction band, uh, and the ratio of your interaction at the at this localized state uh, to the hybridization here is denoted by delta, but delta, if you think about it, is the density of states of the conduction band times the hybridization element V squared. So if this is big enough, then necessarily you will form the magnetic moment. That is, the occupation number of F here, he considered D, uh, D shell, uh, at, in state up will be, will be different from the occupation with spin down, right? So this is quite non-intuitive, but this is the, the hard fog this is what hard fog will give you. And then there was, um, of course, the paper by Schiffer Wolf and then Chun Kondo, who said that, you know, although a heat moment will form, it will never survive at zero temperature, and the reason it does not survive is because we have a Kondo effect. So as we cool the system down, basically this moment will couple to the conduction band and completely dissolve in it. Of course, in principle, in, uh, in the, when we talk, when we really think about F elect uh, electrons with the uh, in, so occupying F orbitals, we really uh, classify the states in terms of the total angular momentum number, not not spin. But ultimately, there's, we're still dealing with Kramer's doubles, right? So, for all practical purposes, is spin one half. Uh, so, at zero temperature, again, the moment, moment, this magnetic moment is gone. So far, so good. Now we put it in the lattice again, as I said. I make a claim in the beginning, I want to discuss really the latest version when we have both Fs and, and, and conductions. And so, uh, in, um, uh, the, just the bottom line is that when you, when you merge these moments in the lattice, the two things ultimately can happen, that the system sort of strongly renormalizes at some low temperatures and forms a new um, highly renormalized metallic state. Uh, by highly renormalization, I mean that effective masses can actually exceed bare electron masses by thousands or so. And on top of that, you can actually also form an insulator. So, and this is good, right? We want ultimately to get the topological insulator out of it. So, we're not, the model is not at all uh, unrealistic. So, now I'm going to go quickly discuss um, topology in, in the context of the, what, what I've told you. And basically, the reasoning is quite simple. The reasoning is this, that indeed you start with non-interacting model, and we have two types of orbitals in our model, and naturally, since we look for, uh, we look for this physics of topological insulators, we want to take the uh, model which, have, which would have uh, even an odd parity band, so since F are by construction odd parity, so let's consider conductions to be even parity bands. So this is the simplest example of 1D, uh, one-dimensional brilliant zone, there are only two high symmetry points, and basically, imagine that I start with a non-interacting model, and then I will have, uh, say, odd parity band above the Fermi level, which is in the gap, and the even parity band below. And then I assign um, uh, the values of these uh, energies, single particle energies in the valence band, plus one, 
if, if their energy is below the energy of the, of the uh, old quality band. And now imagine that I switch off uh, the interactions. And what interactions can do, and you can actually indeed do the LDA calculation, density functional theory calculation, you start with non interactive spectrum, then you switch on the Hubbard U. What actually happens, if you like enough, you can form the gap, so that you, you still preserve the gap, but the bands will invert. Yeah? And so because bands are inverting here, I now at the point X, this so here I just put consider the inversion at point X, so they invert, so the sign changes here, and then the claims is this, there's the fact that they inverted ultimately by, again, using what Foucault told us, uh, and using the concept of the bulk boundary correspondence, I will, came, I will claim that now if I invert even number of times, ultimately I will get at the surface single Dirac, single Dirac uh, comb. Um, so here I just like quickly review the bulk boundary correspondence. Basically, again, the idea is that uh, is that if you consider the bulk system with the bulk gap and the and the boundary, the only two things are possible. That is, you can either cross the Fermi level can cross the surface states even an odd number of times. Ultimately, you can tweak, you can slightly change the parameters of your Hamiltonian, and these states will either go and merge into conduction band and the valence band, and you end up with the uh, gap system. Uh, however, if you have odd number of crossings, that which translates to the odd number of band inversions, uh, nothing you can do really apart from breaking the symmetries. And here again, for the remaining of my talk, my relevant symmetries are time reversal symmetry and, uh, and invariance. Then no, no, no matter what you do, you always have a crossing here, and this is, uh, this is sort of, let's say, it's topologically protected. So we're looking in this, for this physics in, in the model I, I described to you. So now I go into specifics. So now I took this limit of different use and different bandwidth. So this is what we have. Just for simplicity, I consider just the dispersion less f electrons. Uh, the only, again, caveat here, which I will come back to, is in principle this alpha is not a spin index. It's actually the generacy of the f level. And for practical purposes, it can be either doubly degenerate or uh, fourfold degenerate. Uh, this is actually play, plays an important role uh, for experiments. Uh, but I will, again, if time permits, I will come back to that uh, in what follows. I just want to keep things defined, right? So alpha here, again, runs over the, uh, the components of this F electron multiple. <coughs> and again, the most important term is this one. Uh, in the tight binding model, this is just describes the hoping between the conductions and Fs. From F, I mean, even odd orbitals to the uh, uh, from even orbitals to odd parity orbitals, and by construction again it will be non-local. And if we consider T hopping between T and F, it must be linear in momentum simply because we transfer angular momentum L equal one as we do from if we go from T to F and, and vice versa. So all right, so far so good. Now I mean the the of course the pain. Here is just to deal with this guy, and this is actually, as I will show later, this is the largest energy scale in the problem. This is about uh, 2 EV. Uh, and so the way we deal with it is just since it's 2 EV, largest energy scale in the problem, let's just send this to infinity. Uh, and uh, the price we pay for it is that since we're sending to infinity, it basically means that we cannot occupy the f-state by, by more than one electron. And so this is implemented in the model, is implemented by introducing the projection operator B, which is a boson. Uh, and this boson basically, in all the calculations you do of thermodynamic properties and transport, this, this boson basically takes into account the fact that doubly occupied F states do not contribute at all. It projects them out. And then, of course, we have to put this constraint, basically this statement of projecting out uh, highly occupied states uh, translates into this constraint. And so in infinite U limit, we got rid of the Hubbard U, but we got both this boson sticking around here in the, in the F, uh, F electron terms. And then, of course, I make the brutal approximation. I just say, you know, let's just replace this boson with a, with a number, which is especially, um, uh, which does not, does not really depend on the side. So it's just the number. And this is basically what corresponds to the mean field theory. Uh, and so, since it's a mean field theory, we have to come up with a set of, we can basically calculate, as soon as we, we did this, basically, again, we're back to the Gaussian level, single particle theory, then we calculate the energy, and then we can write down the uh, thermo, thermo, uh, thermodynamic potential, and then minimize it, free energy, if you like, and minimize it with respect to B as well as the chemical potentials, they're all three parameters in the model. So, at the end of the day, this is the mean field Hamiltonian, so again, 
the good thing is that uh, is that again it's almost it's basically almost helium three B Hamiltonian. So to convince ourselves that this is uh, indeed um, um, to convince ourselves that this is a controlled approximation, so in principle you can just plot A versus temperature. The control parameter here, I didn't tell you, so the control parameter here is only one quarter because I implicitly here consider the case of the fourfold degenerate multiplet. Interestingly enough, this A translates into a hybridization gap which can be measured, um, which can be measured in some of the materials. Uh, reliably, and for some materials the mean field works wonders, for some of the materials the mean field is not as good. Uh, for, uh, for multiple reasons, one of them including the fact that this transition here is not really a true secondary transition, it's a crossover behavior, so fluctuations may become important in some of them. So now we have the single particle Hamiltonian and we can basically uh, adopt the Foucault uh, scheme for the calculation, so we have a party symmetry and time reversal symmetry in the problem, and all now we need to do to, to figure out the, to compute the topological invariant is just basically using this Hamiltonian figure out the eigenvalues of the parity operator. That's what Fu and Kane told us. Uh, and in this mean field model, this, is, this becomes absolutely trivial exercise for the, for the, for the, uh, for the, for the following reason. F uh, is, as you remember, is odd in momentum. So it means it's very, and since we have to basically calculate uh, this um, eigenvalue parity operator eigenvalues of the high symmetry points of the brillium zone by construction, Fs vanish, vanish at the high symmetry points. And so basically, then the, um, the eigenvalues are given by the energy difference between, uh, between this again, conduction electron and F electron silicon particle energies at the high symmetry points. And then basically what we need to do, so there are four indices overall, there is a strong topological index, new node, and the three weak ones. I'm going to ignore weak ones, I just care about this new node. Uh, ultimately, again, it tells you how many times the bands, even the node parity bands, invert in the three-dimensional uh, three brilliant zone. And then uh, basically going through very just the parameters, the mean field parameters, you can basically come up with this diagram, which shows that I mean, uh, yesterday we thought that we hit the insulator, we get the topological insulator. Have, here you have to cool it down. The statement is when you cool it down, you, 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 all, you necessarily will find something interesting. This is very sort of somewhat non-physical picture. More physical one is to plot this diagram in terms of the F orbital occupation numbers. And you find that basically for the most relevant materials, as I will go, as I will tell you in, in a minute, um, uh, this is the this is where some of the materials are. So is that this is so-called mixed valence regime, and you, again we have much less than one electron per per off orbital. And then in this regime, when we have sort of local uh, local moment regime, we have a well-defined spin. Um, unfortunately, this is the weak topological insulator, right? So we, it means that. Banding, we have even number of band inversions, and this state is not stable with respect to perturbation, so it can be killed by disorder, even potential disorder. Uh, what saves the day is the observation that basically, if we now we keep um, we increase the degeneracy of the Kramers uh, of the of the f orbitals involved, then uh, then this state can be killed so completely, and we can essentially extend the strong topological insulator state all the way to the local moment. So the statement is that the degeneracy uh, favors the STI state. Um, for we actually implemented the scheme for the, some of the for some of the materials uh, and found that indeed, I mean, uh, in principle, you can consider the model where you invert bands at the x points, and um, you know, there are three x points, so you're guaranteed to have a strong topological insulator state. So in here, basically, the result um, that indeed all the way up to the local moment regime, strong topological insulator is there. The choice of the orbitals is not is not random. In principle, we tried several models, but this specific choice of the orbital corresponds to a concrete material, which I will discuss in a second. I would like to discuss another thing, which is relevant, is the is the surface states. So it turns out that. Um, 
uh, in terms of technicalities, I mean, you can figure out the dispersion of the Dirac cones by basically projecting your bulk Hamiltonian in one of the surfaces and solving eigenvalue problem. So you end up, this is in strike contrast with bismuth selenide, uh, bismuth based uh, topological insulators. Um, is that, I mean, here you end up <coughs> naturally of having three Dirac cones on the surface. Um, and they, they are uh, quite, uh, uh, quite anisotropic as far as the X and Y points are concerned. And there is an also relevant question which I just I, I decided not um, to, to discuss here for basically to save some time. Is that basically you can also think about the text spin texture. As it turns out that the spin texture uh, is determined by the symmetry of the underlying F orbital multiplets in, in 3D. So depending on which multiplet you will take, it's, as I remind you, so here for the relevant uh, materials, J is equals 5 half, so it means you have a six-fold degenerate multiplet, and the choice in the cubic symmetry either have a quartet or a doublet. So depending on which one you have, you will have different spin texture, and uh, this actually thing has been measured experimentally as well. So there are, there are more to the surface states than I'm, I, I will tell you. So now I would, I, I would like to actually proceed and tell you a bit about the... Yes? What do you mean by different aspects? I mean, the surface is just, you know, the broken inversion, so it's Rajba type of, you know, Hamiltonian... No, you, what, you have a Dirac Hamilton, or Rajba, yeah, call it. No, I'm saying that in principle you are... Um, well, I, I'm not plotting it here, but in principle you can imagine that spins here, right, go around in this fashion. So assume this is a kind of spin up, right? Mm -hmm. It can go around this, and this guy also goes clockwise, etc., right? This is one type. Another type that when they go around in the being normal to the Fermi surface, yeah? Okay. So these are two different things which can be proved experimentally. But, uh, I mean, they are the same issue, right? They are uh, the same up to, you know, rotation by pi over 2 or something like that, right? Well, but... <laughs> they're not this, what do you mean they're the same? I mean, one thing is uh, they are completely orthogonal to each other, right? No, but I'm, just, I'm saying that I, I can take Rush for Hamilton and do it. Uh, yeah. Right, by, by oh, no, no, no. I mean, in, in, in the paper will that. take everything. Yeah. Paper obviously will take everything. But the, when basically people <laughs> come and do in the lab the experiment, they actually find different spin textures for different, uh, for different materials. Right? And even calculation will tell you the same. So the saddle, I mean, I, 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 I can, I mean, I can okay. give you much more details than that. It's just I, um, I would like to avoid this discussion uh, right now. Uh, but this is, yeah, basically, this is just one example. Uh, here we, we, we actually show this uh, how the spins go around uh, for the for the quartet, right? For the doublet, again, they will stick out. But I mean, this is what optics will, will tell you. Yeah? Optics cannot say they are equivalent; they are different. Yeah. Uh, are you sure? Yes. Optics, so, the, 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 the chirality, the sense of you know going that way or that way, is actually exactly the same, right? Maybe so, no, but there are all right. Let's let's postpone Dima. Yeah. I okay. I mean I can I can show you pictures and uh, we can talk. About no, I, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So now back to reality. Uh, uh, so uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau, one of my favorite quotes: uh, "The world of imagination is boundless." The world of reality has its limits. So let's see if the if this uh, modeling, theoretical modeling, uh, is still within the limits of reality. Um, basically, where to look for again, as I as I said before, so we will look at the materials which have will have highest highest uh, Hubbard and uh, highest spin orbit coupling, and this uh, will be for f or five f orbitals. Again, for the for the purposes of this talk, I will focus on four f. Uh, material, this is an actual number, so again, the much exceed um, uh, D compared to F. I mean, the, the size of the Hubbard balls and, and the spin orbit coupling in F's are far exceeds uh, the, the value of the corresponding couplings in D. But the, the back, I mean, the sort of the, the drawback is, of course, this physics is, is a low temperature physics, right? So the, 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 uh, the, the states, if they stabilize, right, when the hybridization gap opens and bends invert, at some point, this happens typically at very low temperature, so well below 100 Kelvin. All right, here are the examples of some of the insulators I've been talking about. 
this is the most interesting one, uh, the most, two, I should say, to the left plot is the most interesting one. This is Samaria MB6 and the Terra MB12. So Samaria MB6 turns out to be very old uh, material, people, uh, it's a narrow gap semiconductor, but it has a very non-trivial optical relaxation pro uh, purposes which people uh, thought to use uh, as, uh, in, in sensors and there's been a lot of work done in the 70s and 80s in Japan. Uh, but uh, what's uh, sort of uh, interesting about this is that, you know, uh, there, is a, there is a basically almost uh, four orders of magnitude increase in resistivity, but when then you look closely at what happens at very low temperatures, you would find that conductivity remains fine. And the value of conductivity far exceeds the old estimates you would do um, in, in the lives of the UFA regular limit, for example, but, but for example, below the, the E squared over H bar, say. Um, and the, the understanding of actually where insulator will come from is, is, is essentially trivial. Is that, you know, if you and Sir Neville Mott discussed this many years ago, uh, basically, you know, if you have, if, if your conductions in Epson hybridized, I mean, separately, the, the separate number is concerned, as soon as they hybridize, only total number of electrons must be conserved. But now, if you uh, if the total number of C's and F's is twice an integer, then you necessarily will have to fill out the lower <coughs> band and keep the upper band um, uh, unoccupied, so it's uh, just a trivial band insulator. Modulo the fact that I mean, it's driven by interactions, both Hubbard interactions to have certain number of F's involved in the picture and hybridization. And there are two gaps in the problem. There is a direct gap, which is in, in Samaria B6 is, uh, is about uh, 50 Kelvin, and there is also an indirect gap, which is much smaller, the order of 10 Kelvin. But again, I'm mostly focusing on this effect that below 5 Kelvin, this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is inverse pl plotted in inverse temperature, so I'm just focusing on this effect here, where the conductivity, resistivity, actually in this case it's resistivity, it saturates. Uh, so, hope surface for exotic insulator, and this refers to the uh, to the Samaria B6. And now I'm going to sort of switch some switch gears completely, and say that let's forget about all the all the theory stuff I told you. And in principle, let's think about uh, what uh, what does it does it take experimentally to prove that you have a topological insulator, right? The bismuth based uh, materials, in that sense, sort of don't. Um, uh, uh, Provide a challenge in the sense that I'm, I sort of I implicitly assume that I want to say I implicitly assume transport. So can you actually do it through transport properties? If your bulk is uh, is conducting, then I mean you only you can only rely on Arpis, and this what would make the bismuth based topological insulator so successful, right? Because you just probe the surface, and the surface is the state. Here, the the backside of the story is that I mean you can do transport. As long as you like, because your bulk is insulating, and actually I'm going to show this, but I mean, the, the RPS is quite challenging simply because you have to go at low, very low temperature, so you cannot really resolve. It's hard, I should say. You can, but it's hard to resolve the states reliably. Although it has been done as time went on. Um, so, uh, this is the force of this checklist, if you like. So, uh, if we indeed we're dealing with a true ideal, uh, you name it, a topological insulator, um, is that you need to show that. Transport is limited to the surface. Uh, the time reversal symmetry breaking least localization. Number three, that the strong spin orbit, we have a spin or, strong spin orbit coupling on the surface, which means helicity of your carriers. But again, it doesn't mean that we have Dirac spectrum, so you need actually to show this separately that your electrons on the surface have a Dirac spectrum. So I want to quickly review some of the experiments which sort of address all of this point here. Okay, um, the, the uh, uh, surface transfer. So there are two sets of experiments, they're all very nice. So I'm, I'm just giving them, I'm reviewing them as, as they appear. So the first one was basically uh, proposed, was done by the group of Jim Allen in Ann Arbor. Uh, the idea is, is quite simple. They say that, you know, depending on the combination of the contacts you, you attach to the, to the sample, if your um, if your sample is bulk, is a conductor in the bulk, at least some of them, such as here, is uh, they denoted hybrid plus lateral, they should fall on top of each other. If, this, if the bulk is not conducting but only surface does, they must they <coughs> definitely give you different resistivities. 
this model was actually this this has been modeled by uh, by just actually putting it on the computer and calculating it. And there is quite an remarkable agreement between the simulation on the right and the experimental data on the left. Uh, and in, in some sense, the idea of this experiment is similar. Uh, sorry, the idea of this experiment which I'm showing you is similar to the previous one, uh, but. Uh, is just you know the statement is that you know you the ohm law must break. As remember, so there is a there is a relation between the resistivity and the resistance, and here there is a ratio of the area of the surface to the to the thickness of the sample. So clearly, if the bulk is not conducting, right, the your resistivity should be independent or resistance ratio, if you like, should be independent of the thickness of the sample. If only surface is conducting, and this is amazingly what is seen. So I just want to point your attention to the black curve and the red curve. So you see below 5 Kelvin, if you I mean, zoom it out, you will see that below 5 Kelvin, they just basically fall on top of each other. So the statement is from these two experiments, and then above 5 Kelvin, both bulk and surface are conducting, but below 5 Kelvin, only surface uh, conducts. And this is again an agreement with the previous transport measurements from 70s and 80s. All right, so number one is sort of checked. Number two, uh, this is the stability of the states with respect to the, uh, to the time reversal breaking scattering. Uh, here, uh, this is the result from the Irvine. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, basically, the material is doped with magnetic gadolinium and non-magnetic yttrium atoms. And, uh, and they show going measure, measuring resistivity down to millikelvins that basically uh, 3% of yttrium doesn't really do much, while gadolinium causes the strong localization of the scatters. And I mean, idea is, is clear. I mean, as soon as you you will backscatter, uh, you cannot backscatter if you if you if your potential um, if your disorder um, doesn't break time reversal symmetry. While of course you can flip the spin and backscatter if. Uh, you have magnetic impurities, and gadolinium carries quite a sizable uh, magnetic moment. Um, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Is there any idea what the, carrier, what the surface carrier density is? There? Yes, it's, it's actually quite big. Uh, surprisingly big. 10 to the, yes, yes. Although I think there were two reports, so they're, they're a bit different, but in the, in the order of magnitude is 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, yeah. Um, so, uh, the, the size of the spin orbit coupling in principle can be probed by observing the, quant the correction to the um, quantum correction to conductivity. I just want to quickly, I, how much time do I have? Um, uh, five minutes. Five minutes, no, all right. More. Then I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, but lunch is, I mean, I don't want to lunch, just, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm the only one staying between you and lunch, so <laughs> it's, it's a very risky position. Um, so, uh, just quickly, on the quantum correction to conductivity, I just want to remind you basically that the scattering, we're scattering, uh, we can scatter from k to minus k along the two different paths, and uh, provided that the phase of the electrons uh, doesn't change, there will be interference correction to conductivity. I mean, if people first discussed it as a gang of four in 79, then there was a classical paper by Gorkov, Larkin, and Milnitsky in 79. Showing that indeed this interference, there is interfer in 2D, there is interference correction to conductivity, and this goes as a log of tau phi over transport time, and that tau phi uh, phase coherence <coughs> time is basically diverging as you cool the system down. And this is what's called the weak localization. So in, uh, in topological insulators, things are, are um, uh, actually the, because of the spin orbit coupling on the surface, um, these, uh, there will be in destructive interference, and that actually leads to the anti-localization correction to conductivity. So conductivity will grow as you cool the system, if, as you cool the system down. And so that's the prediction. And uh, in principle, we basically uh, did the calculation for uh, for uh, for the surface three Dirac bands. Um, ultimately, we recovered the, the expression of the Hikami Larkin Nagaoka, which has this prefactor alpha and some combination of the T gamma functions, and in principle you can also consider this in the magnetic field, and this is a typical curve you find. The basic statement of our paper was that uh, in, although you typically you expect some universality in the value of alpha in the, in, the, in the standard setup, that is you always have alpha equals to half 
to each conduction channel, right? So ideally, if you, if you have three Dirac cones on the surface, you have to have three. Now, alpha must be three. Um, and in principle, as I will just show in, in, in a second, I mean, this is, uh, this is what experiments see, but unfortunately, the, the issue here is that, uh, just a second, uh, the issue here is that in principle, depending on, I mean, depending even on the quality of the samples, depending on the uh, direction of the field, you get alpha distributed all over the place, from 0.15 to all the way up to 3. Um, in our theory, we actually included, we just showed that in principle, as soon as you, as soon as you include intraband scattering, that basically always leads to a certain value of alpha less than 1, but in principle, again, there is no universality whatsoever. So the only kind of good message for us is that indeed weak anti-localization is observed here, which sort of we interpret as a signature of, um, of a strong spin-orbit coupling. At the surface, an ultimate check uh, for us is the Dirac. Uh, this is the fact that I mean the electrons have a Dirac spectrum, and this is a quantum oscillation measurement. And the idea is simple again: if electrons have a, a Dirac dispersion, that's how their Landau levels, energy of the Landau level, will look like. And so, in quantum oscillation experiment, this is the gas of an alpha done by Lilu group uh, from Ann Arbor and recently published in Science. They basically able to demonstrate that indeed uh, what you can do, you can basically check the position of this minima here in DMDH and plot it as a, as a um, uh, this index and plot it as a function of the inverse field. So this, the idea is that if you set this field to infinity, you will always have to have a contribution from the zero Landau level because it decouples from the field, and it means it translates into the fact that you cross. Uh, vertical axis here at exactly minus a half. This is the sort of bay phase signature. And this is what apparently they see. There are somewhat unexpected results from their experiments, including the fact that the mass of the carriers they extract from their uh, data is actually quite, uh, quite small. And this is not what theory would predict. It, theory would predict much larger values of the effective masses. Uh, but in principle, this can also be interpreted as the fact that you have a strong surface potential, there is a strong disorder scattering, and you, in fact, apart from Dirac's in gap states, you have trivial in gap states there, which might actually contribute to this. Uh, but very, very recently, there was again another paper, quantum oscillation results from the uh, Suchitra Sebastian group at uh, Cambridge. And um, it's called the title Unconventional Fermi Surface in an Insulating State. Um, uh, the, the upshot is basically these two panels, you know, you don't have to look further than these two. So on one panel here it shows res resistance, which again, this is some item 6, which basically again exponentially grows and then saturates. And then in this plot she basically shows the, uh, the quantum oscillations and magnetization. Right, so this is uh, quite striking because, I mean, we, right, we either have an insulator and there is no Fermi surface, there should be no oscillations. Or there could be small oscillations, like a little data due to the Dirac states, or you you have bulk Fermi surface which give you oscillations, but you cannot have an insulator. Uh, so summary is that the samples they claim that the samples are bulk insulators, but rapid quantum oscillations correspond to the 50 the, the size of the orbit basically spans over the 50 percent of the the volume of the brilliant zone. Large mean free paths, few microns, but this sort of agrees with the previous data from quantum pole and other measurements. But the, the most striking thing, this is actually in clear contradiction to the paper of Lilu published basically in the same journal but half a year uh, uh, before. And again, they can do the same trick as Lilu did, so take the position of this maxima, extrapolate to zero, and they have exact crossing at zero. Yes, Quantum oscillations, is it the this is the gas of Nelfin. Nobody ever saw in these materials the Shubnik of the gas. That is resistivity. It's all M versus H. Do you know how these samples were grown? These samples were grown by flux uh, flow, aluminum flux. Both. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. This is all. I mean, they. Yeah, yeah. This is all flux flow. But actually, uh, the. I can tell in the privacy of my own house. I mean, more details on that. I mean, but there are no issues with samples growing. This is very well respected. Uh, Alright, um, so let me just, before I conclude, let me 
uh, acknowledge my collaborators, Victor Alexandrov, who used to be a graduate student in Rutgers, he is now a postdoc at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Victor Galitsky from Maryland, Kai, who is now a professor at Ann Arbor, JD, also now assistant professor at Ann Arbor, and Pierce, and the weak localization project we've done together with Max Vavilov. Unfortunately, as a I couldn't download his figure from the internet, but I'm sure many of you know his, his face. Uh, and Kosti Kicherji, who is, uh, has been a postdoc at Rutgers now, he is at NASA Ames Lab in California. So, uh, the most, to me, it is the most exciting. Um, continuation of the work lies in the analysis of the many body instabilities in the surface states. There are some indications that actually uh, the interactions between these Dirac electrons on the surface are quite strong that might even lead to the excitonic, various types of excitonic instabilities. This needs to be analyzed more carefully, of course. And, of co and um, uh, quantum oscillation data, which is quite puzzling. But uh, just given this bulk of experimental data, I mean, there are strong reasons to believe that indeed some ion B6 is, uh, is an example of topological insulators. So I would like to thank you for your attention.